Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the November 2021 meeting of the Health Environment Social Services Committee meeting. My name is Brandon Smith. I am the chair of the committee. I have some announcements to make before we get started from a housekeeping perspective, and then we will proceed with our meeting. First of all, please note this meeting is being recorded uh, and is being called to order in accordance with the New York State Open Meetings Law. It's the practice of CB2 to conduct remote meetings with all committee members' cameras on. Public attendees are also encouraged to leave their cameras on, particularly if you're given the floor to speak. All attendees, please keep your microphone muted when you are not speaking. To maintain an appropriate discussion and voting process, I will make it known when and which topics are open for comment by committee members, board members at large, and the general public. If you have questions that fall outside of public comment time, please type your questions in the chat panel and we will address them as time permits. You may also email the district office at any time outside of these meetings. Uh, we are also committed to providing access for our neighbors, regardless of physical ability or limitation. If you require accommodation or assistance for full participation, please contact the district office 72 hours before any public meeting. We also ask that anyone speaking or presenting use plain language, speak at a moderate tone, frequently ask if you're speaking loud enough. Uh, if presenting, read the title of every slide, describe any images on the slide, such as photos, graphs, and charts. Finally, before I get started, I want to maintain a comment that I made re recently at several previous meetings, and that is that it is fundamentally important that we maintain a respectful atmosphere at these meetings. Anyone who's acting in a disrespectful manner, I will ask to be removed from the meeting for, by, by the host, regardless of whether they are a committee member, a member of the public, or a presenter, or regardless of your stature or who you are. So just let that be known. Um, at this point, I'm going to introduce and have each of the committee members introduce themselves, and uh, I have a brief announcement before we'll commence our agenda. Uh, Ms. McKnight, would you like to introduce yourself? Good evening, everyone. I am Nicole McKnight, board member. I'm also happy to announce and, uh, and congratulate Ms. McKnight on becoming the vice chair of the committee. I'm excited to work with you, Nicole. And along with Jessica and Carol Ann, I'm hopeful that we'll all form a, a great leadership team that will uh, assist in managing this committee better, and better with uh, greater governance and better expediency in the future. Um, I appreciate that, Brandon. Thank you. Jessica, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Jessica Thurston. I'm the secretary. Excellent. Ms. Church, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Carol Ann Church, assistant district manager. Great. Ms. Anadu, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Emily Anadu, I'm public member of the Health and Economic Services Committee. Thank you. Mr. Newmark. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm Barry Newmark, and I'm a public member. Okay. Um, Mr. Varela. Uh, Alejandro Varela, a public member. Hi. Uh, Ms. Einhorn. Thank you, Ms. Einhorn. Your audio is a little unclear, but um, we'll look forward to having you engage. We did understand you're a member of the Health and the Economic Development Committee, and thank you for joining us. Um, we are also happy to be joined by at least one board member, maybe two. Ms. Masso, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Latrell, and I'm a, I'm a member of the community board, too, and I'm also a member of the economic committee. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us. I think I saw Ms. Ali on earlier, but I don't see her now, so I'm going to move on. Um, a couple announcements just for any members of the public who are attending tonight and also for committee members. For members of the public, I know there's been a lot of concern about the uh, recent proposals to build homeless shelters uh, in downtown Brooklyn. There is a separate meeting about this, which is scheduled for Monday, November 8th at uh, 7 p.m. 
uh, separate Zoom announcement went out for that. Uh, we are not presenting any action items about this on this agenda, but we're happy to discuss anything in the public uh, community forum. I would just suggest that uh, we we pick up any discussion about the uh, about the homeless shelters at the specific town hall that's been dedicated for that on Monday. Um, separately, I'm going to make an enhanced effort to make this meeting uh, adhere to timing requirements that are specified in the agenda. And I'm gonna enforce the timing requirements that are in the agenda while making sure that we allow time for public comment on each item. So with that in mind, I'd like to proceed with a motion for approval of tonight's agenda. Mr. Newmark is first, Ms. McKnight is the second. Um, all in favor? Anyone opposed, please so state or abstain. Unanimous. Um, we are next very happy to have a presentation again from our committee member, Barry Newmark. Uh, on uh, COVID-19 and an update. Barry, the floor is yours. I ask that you try to keep it to about five minutes, uh, but we have a total time of 10 minutes for this. Thanks, Brandon. Um, I'm gonna begin with um, the stats that we've been looking at each month. And, uh, but before I do so, I wanna thank um, Lindsay and um, Emily for their help in uh, thinking through some of the um, broader concepts, which I'll get to once I've gone through the statistics. I'll also be sending all of this to our uh, committee secretary, chair, and to um, Carol Ann, so that uh, should anybody want to um, look at any of this afterwards, they're welcome to do so. So to make a long story short, um, in the neighborhoods of our community district, um, there's been some improvement in, in some key areas from last month. Uh, the number of cases, new cases in the past seven days um, has decreased in every area in our community district and new cases are at a lower rate than that for New York City and for Brooklyn uh, borough wide, except for East, North and South Williamsburg. Um, their uh, rate of new cases is a bit higher than the Brooklyn rate. For um, total cases, um, there's not much to say about that. They've increased a little bit. Um, deaths, uh, unfortunately, uh, increased um, from last month, but increased at a much lower number and lower rate than they had been increasing previously. So that's really good. And the deaths per 100,000 people thus far are lower in all our neighborhoods than the rate for Brooklyn and New York City. Um, and finally, in terms of vaccination rates, um, vaccination rates went up slightly for uh, Brooklyn Heights, Dumbo, and downtown Brooklyn from 83% last month to 85%. Um, they went up in um, Borham Hill from 71 to 73%. And they went up in Clinton Hill Prospect Heights from 79 to 81%. Unfortunately, they um, stayed the same in Fort Greene, Bed-Stuy, and Clinton Hill at 55%. Um, the same in South Williamsburg at 58%. And went up 1% in East North Williamsburg to 58%. These VAX rates are lower than in Brooklyn, um, borough-wide and in New York City, um, which takes me to the second piece of the presentation, which is um, thoughts that the three of us have had um, since last month. And I wanna just go through it briefly. And again, uh, it'll be available to those who are interested in written form. Uh, Emily and Lindsay added that we're also interested in strategies that address the age gap and subsequent inequities in participation. The city has strategies to increase participation in the 18 and under demographics until the emergency use authorization is lifted and schools institute a vaccine mandate. Whether or not that happens, we don't know. Until that time, maybe this is something we can partner with the Youth Education and Cultural Affairs Committee on. Additionally, we do know there are systemic inequities in vaccination 
and we should continue to dig in, but the CB2 data is still not available to us on that level. We suggest requesting further information from DOHMH and request they attend a committee meeting. We should write out questions for them in advance to request additional data and info information ahead of such a meeting. We think the basic questions we all have begin with in CB2. What is the vaccination rate by zip code, by age, sex, and ethnicity? How is the city collecting, monitoring, and acting on this data? Do we know why the non-vaccinated choose to remain so? How can we find out? What type of outreach efforts might work? What has been tried? Who can do the most effective outreach? What strategies exist in our district specifically to address inequities in vaccination status? What strategies in our district specifically exist to address the low vaccination rate among those 18 and younger? What strategies exist to engage those newly eligible for vaccination? Five to 12 year olds, now that they are eligible for shots, would they be eligible for boosters as well? How would the city continue to employ mobile vaccination sites to leverage public events, especially in areas where vaccination rates are lower? How, are, how is the city addressing or changing strategies in neighborhoods where we've seen stagnation and, and no increase in the vaccination rates month to month? Can the community board partner with Department of Health on an event to support areas where we've seen stagnation? We would love to see what effectiveness of the $100 incentive has been to get people fully vaccinated since they were offering the full incentive with the first dose. And there's a site that uh, Emily um, shared, which is uh, good for um, booking and seeing where, multi, where the mobile vaccination clinics are, but we're concerned about how much awareness there may be um, and how well that's been publicized. Um, and that site, uh, we can publish that site later on. So that, that concludes my presentation. And um, I think Brandon, uh, you'd like to field some questions if anyone has any. Sure, we have a few minutes for questions on this, but I'll just note we, had, we invited Department of Health to this meeting and so far we're, we're awaiting back to hear from them. What might make sense is if you can make sure that, that we, myself, Nicole, Jessica, and Carol Ann get a hold of those questions. Absolutely. Perhaps we can meet in the meantime between this and the next meeting. Pick, try to integrate the questions with what we've already sent them and try to figure out what's the most reasonable expectation for when we can get the information to Department of Health and get them to come to a meeting. As to when we can partner with Yeka or, or engage in a different project, could we potentially pick up that conversation in other business? With that, were there any questions from members of the committee? We have about five minutes for uh, questions for uh, Mr. Newmark. With that said, I'm just gonna quickly, I wanna incorporate anyone else, um, board members or members of the public who have questions for Mr. Newmark about COVID-19. Brandon, this is Alejandro, can you hear me? Sure, go ahead. Sorry, I, I think I missed my moment there. I just wanted to quickly add, well, first, thank you, Barry and, and others who worked on this and it's great. Uh, I just wanna add that as far as uh, child vaccines, for example, we heard today from our principal at my, our kid's school, they go to PS20 in the district and uh, that uh, there will be a, a the city's gonna provide um, a van on Monday from 12 to four. And so people can just sort of show up with their kids and from 12 to four and get vaccinated. We were also told there's an incentive program for a hundred dollars for every referral. So when you go get vaccinated and they ask you who referred you here, if you say PS20, for example, and I suspect they're doing this with all the schools, the school gets $100 up to $20,000. That's good to know. Um, perhaps we can fit that into our discussion uh, for the, uh, taking it forward with Department of Health. Um, any other thoughts on uh, COVID-19 before we move to the presentation? All right, uh, delighted to welcome here today, Ms. Tiffany Robin, uh, who's here from the Brooklyn Queens Long Island Health Education Center um, for a presentation on the opioid epidemic and impact in Brooklyn. 
Uh, Ms. Robin, are you with us? Can you see us, hear us? Thank you so much for coming. Um, we're delighted to, a lot, to give you a little bit of our time. If you could try to keep your presentation to around 10 minutes, that would be great. And uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tiffany Robin. I'm here from the Brooklyn, Queens, Long Island Area Health Education Center. And I'm here with Dr. Minerva Francis Nelson, who will be the presenter tonight. Um, she has a lot of information um, and I'm excited to hear her speak. Um, our organization services the Brooklyn, Queens, and Long Island areas, and we strive to educate students and the community about different health topics and also get them into health careers. So without further ado, Dr. Minerva Francis Nelson. Hi, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll um, start, start my timer now, and um, I'll do my best to be cogent but efficient um, to honor everyone's time. So I'm going to share my screen. Thumbs up, everybody can see? Okay, yeah. awesome. So... Uh, Quick overview about New York City and the opioid epidemic. Um, so quick question, is drug poisoning the leading cause of death um, or injury in the United States? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs down, I see some thumbs up. So, so, thumbs down. The answer is yes, it is. It is the leading cause of death um, and injury um, in the United States. And so with that said, um, it's important to note that in New York City, it's the third leading cause of death um, uh, that, that leads to, um, that, that's related to, to drug poisoning. And um, the, these deaths are related most commonly to opioids. And there was some um, articles that was published um, around 2014, and this data still continues that indicates that unintentional opioid overdose deaths can continue to rise both in New York State um, and New York City and throughout the nation. So important to know that there were three waves of the opioid deaths. And it first, the first wave started in 1999, and that was the rise in prescription opioid overdose deaths. Then the second wave, which is indicated by the dark blue line, that has been, that was the second rise in heroin related opioid deaths, and that occurred in 2010. When we got to 2013, that is the third wave, and we're sort of still in the third wave. We may be approaching the fourth, and that has been a rise in synthetic opioid deaths. And as you can see, um, the purple line right here, where the blue arrow indicates um, the synthetic opioid deaths deals with termosol as well as fentanyl. And you may have seen signs on the New York train station or bus stops that talks about fentanyl awareness. And so um, in 1999, there was um, under a million people who have, well, excuse me, since 1999, um, close to a million people or 841,000 people have died of an opioid overdose death or drug overdose uh, or drug overdose deaths. Um, fast forward, between 2019 and 2020, 81,684 people have died of overdose deaths um, between, um, between one year, between May 19, 2019 and May 2020. So the reason it's important that you know about these deaths is because as a result of the increasing opioid-related deaths, Good Samaritan um, immunity drug laws have been enacted in 40 states. The first state to enact um, drug immunity uh, laws was New Mexico. That was in 2007. And New Mexico is right here. I'm at the bottom neck between Texas and Arizona. Um, and then New York State over here next to Pennsylvania um, enacted their uh, drug immunity laws in 2011. And so all of the states that are covered in blue, those are states with overdose immunity laws. Whereas the states that are gray, those are the states that do not have drug immunity laws. 
And so what are drug immunity laws? They protect you from being um, prosecuted um, if you happen to witness an overdose and report it. And so in New York, particularly, um, if a person is caught sharing drugs or possesses drug paraphernalia, possesses marijuana in any quantity, um, possesses alcohol if underage drinking is involved, um, or any other controlled substances under um, eight ounces, they are protected from being pr prosecuted. Whereas the law does not protect people in these cases if they um, have more than eight ounces of, of drugs or a controlled substance on them, if they are in violation of probation, um, if they have any open warrant or have the intent to, to sell drugs or controlled substances. Um, but it is encouraged that if people see something, they say something and, and report a drug overdose. And so what does this look like for Brooklyn? So for Brooklyn residents, um, in 2019, there were 2 million um, and 50, 259 million um, residents. And of those people who have, um, who live in uh, Brooklyn died of an overdose, the, the population most impacted were those aged between 35 years old and 54 years old. Um, but it's important to note um, per 100,000 residents, those aged 55 to 84 had the highest rate of overdose deaths. Again, so what does this look like? 292 residents died of a drug overdose and Brooklyn residents had the second largest number of dr drug overdose deaths after the Bronx. However, if we look at the statistics per 100,000 residents, we see that Brooklyn had the second lowest rate of drug overdose deaths um, followed, um, followed by Queens, which had the lowest. In terms of the racial demographic of who were impacted by overdose deaths among Brooklyn residents, we see that um, white people or Caucasian non-Latino Latinx had the largest number, and these are by count. Um, as whereas per 100,000 percent per 100,000 residents, we see that Brooklyn um, Latino or Latinx residents had the highest overdose re um, death rate, and that's indicated by 21 right here. So looking at the total population in, during 2019 in Brooklyn, we can we see what killed people um, in terms of overdose what drug? So we have fentanyl was the number one, I guess, you know, <laughs> substance that, that killed um, people. And that's the synthetic opioid we talked about earlier. And so it's important to note that both fentanyl and heroin, they're both opioids. And that, and for those who are familiar with the drug Narcan, Narcan can help to reduce opioid overdose deaths if caught in time. So it's important to know what we can do. What we can do is recognize the four C's of addiction. The four C's of addiction include compulsion, cravings, consequences, and uh, control. So a person may have um, an addiction if they have a compulsive drug-seeking behavior, if they have drug cravings, if they continue to use drugs in spite of the negative consequences. That's it could be health related, it could be encounters with the law enforcement. Um, and, and finally, a person may have um, an addiction if they lose control of their drug use. And as a result, they're unable to cut back or practice harm reduction. So um, some components um, related to relapse and relapse is essentially, you know, um, if you have, if you stop for a while and then you, you fully engage in, in drug seeking behavior, but in, in order to like stop relapse, if a person does stop taking drugs, um, it's important to note, um, self-efficacy, which is, um, a person's confidence, um, is important to note the outcome expectancies, um, whether or not, um, their, their positive, um, or negative beliefs about them stopping if they're able to continue. Um, also it, important to note, you know, um, cravings and motivation. And these things are outlined in the DSM-4, which is like the holy grail of um, diet of, of um, mental health diagnoses. 
And so um, important also to know is that one's ability to adopt coping skills, to be aware of emotional states, and also know, noting the accessibility of, of drugs, our, our prescription drugs, you know, found in the, a person's cabinet. What happens to, to the extra drugs, um, you know, is, your, is a person's supplier next, you know, live next door. So here are some, some quick definitions. I know I'm going low on time, um, but basically I just want to say that relapse is a part of addiction. And that if anyone does address someone who is uh, dealing with an addiction, it's important to offer love. And love is an acronym for listening, offering information, validating, and um, offering empathy. And once you, you know, offer love, you're able to hit more green lights. And so here are a list of book recommendations that you may be interested in on the topic. And here are some resources. And that concludes my 10 minute presentation. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. We're very appreciative of your presentation. And I, I wanna thank you for coming and sharing that with us. Um, I know one thing the, the board would want, the, one thing I, I would wanna express is, I assume you will share the, either the slides or the information with the contacts with the board office so that they can be shared with, with all of us and included in our minutes and, and such. Separately, what would you suggest that we as a committee devoted to health and um, among other topics can do to, to support uh, the, the, the effort to spread education about this effort and um, as well as awareness about the different resources, laws, and, and, and issues that you brought up in your presentation? Yeah, I'll be glad to uh, share whatever resources that was presented and information presented here. Um, offhand, I would say um, people who use drugs, they tend to have like this great stigma. And so first to sort of like check yourself in terms of like how does one, you know, feel and react when they do see someone who may um, be addicted to drugs or, you know, um, have some sort of um, really close relationship with drug use. Um, because um, once someone can, you know, acknowledge how, how they're feeling, they may be willing to get trained in, in Narcan. And Narcan is basically the life-saving drug that for opioid, you know, reversal. And, and, I, and, and, and ask yourself, if you are trained and you actually do see one, someone who's having an overdose, um, who's experiencing an overdose, are you willing to save their life? So, I mean, that, that's one thing. So stigma and, and, and being willing, willing to train. And, you know, and, and lastly, the third um, suggestion is that, you know, um, mind the language. Language it can, can, you know, be very um, stigmatizing. For instance, if you say someone is clean, so clean meaning they're not using drugs. Like, you know, you can just say someone's not using drugs anymore because to imply someone is clean, that means that they were dirty before. Um, and that's just one example or, or three examples um, to start. You're muted, Brandon. Thank you. Questions from members of the committee? Ms. Anadu? Um, question and comment. First of all, thank you so much, um, Dr. Minerva, Francis, and I apologize, I can't see that after your hyphenation, um, but thank you so much for the information. And I think, comment first, just that, um, yes, and I think that when we think about overdoses, you know, just in how I've been reading up about this, that it, you know, it falls into this idea of diseases of despair, um, and that it truly is like, it, it is, it is unfortunate byproduct of stress and all these things, like all the things that happen that no one wants to, um, you know, unfortunately become addicted, um, and definitely no one plans to, um, to overdose. Um, and so I think to your point, like the idea of removing um, this, the stigma, but recognizing we're in a time where because of COVID, because of, you know, unemployment, because of so many things that these are the times when things get even tougher. Um, and so to, to Barry's, um, um, sorry, to, to Brandon's earlier comment, I think, yeah, understanding how we can help. Um, and if there are any other initiatives that we can that maybe we're working on. So for example, we have, you know, there are things we're involved with like working with Fort Greene Park around like finding 
peer counselors versus, you know, when someone typically is, it's, it's typically come from a drug involved situation where, you know, the police are called because people are acting out in a certain way. And so the first line of defense being peer counselors versus the police. Um, but so actually I realized maybe I don't have a question, but just thank you so much for the important work you're doing um, and anything we can do to help and link with any other efforts um, we would love to and happy to. And I look forward to finding out how I can get um, training in Narcam because I recognize that there's also even stigmas that some people think that they're helping people be drug addicts if they're carrying around Narcam. And so we're moving all those stigmas, but thank you for your presentation and your work. My pleasure, thank you. Thanks, and Ms. McKnight, I think I saw you also had your hand up. Alejandro had his hand up before me, but I'll, I'll be quick. Um, thank you for your presentation. And I'm just to piggyback on where Emily was going or where she already went. I, I'm thinking about what type of services would you recommend? I know there's a lot of talk about medication, assisted treatment. And there's also, I know at one point, um, the city was looking at putting in a clinic where people can access it to safely use um, drugs. Um, so I, I'm just curious if you would have any feedback in those areas and perhaps we can explore that. Yeah, great question. And you, you touched it, you touched upon it as well. And so this is community board too, right? And so you have to think about how willing are you to have um, a safe consumption room um, or a safe consumption site in your neighborhood? Like, you know, what, you know, what, like what thoughts come to your mind? Because um, research has shown having these rooms available and what safe consumption rooms are, are a place for people to go and, you know, safely use drugs where they might have clean needles and, you know, someone could basically be observed by a clinician so that they don't experience um, overdose death because they're, they're continuing to use. So I don't have any other type of um, hard or tangible um, solutions, but my, my only thing is to ask is that as a community, like what are your thoughts and, you know, how willing are you, um, you know, uh, to, to, to welcome something like that to your neighborhood? And so to, to get more information and sort of do a self check about like what that looks, what that may look like um, is, is a good start. Thank you. Um, we're running over time on our presentation, so I'm going to only be able to take a few more questions, but I have Mr. Varela, and then we're, uh, I'll let Ms. Ali ask her question, and I also want to open it up to members of the community. If you have any questions, now would be the time to raise your hand. Mr. Varela? Thank you, Brandon. I'll be quick. Uh, hi, Dr. Francis Nelson. Thank you for your wonderful presentation and for the work that you do. I, um, I wondered if you had any, and maybe you can't because of the uh, maybe this isn't a, this is an issue that better left for another time, but around the decriminalization of drugs. My understanding is that in the countries, societies, and cities within the United States where they have decriminalized drugs, uh, all drugs, all classes of drugs, we have seen an increase in quality of life for the people who were uh, being stopped more often than not. It was always disproportionate, Black and Indigenous folks, of course, um, that includes Latinx folks um, as well. But um, I wonder if you are hearing, um, is there more movement for that here in this city? Do you feel that that would aid in your work? Going back to your point around stigma. And I just wanna say real quick that to get ahead of the typical critique, not from you, but in general, which is that you know, we didn't want to talk about condoms. We didn't wanna talk about safe injection sites. We never wanna talk about the things that work because they make us uncomfortable. Um, but then the science shows that they absolutely work. And so I guess what I'm wondering is we have to, we have we have to do the work to get past our discomfort with things right and and really just do the stuff that works yes absolutely and um uh the drug policy um alliance or dpa.org I'll, I'll drop that in the chat um they are a good resource and they absolutely um advocate um to decriminalize all drugs and they're also, um, you know, you know, advocating that the federal government decriminalize marijuana as well. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ali, you had a question as well. 
Yes, uh, looking at your slides, um, Dr. Minerva, I see that some of the highest death rates were with the synthetic opioid. And I, I guess it was the slides were moving a little bit too fast for me to grasp all the information, but was there any correlation to the cost of procurement and the risk of the um, persons that were dying from the drug? The cost of the drug? Um, yeah, like it, with, with the more expensive drug related to a special race? No, no, not, no. Was because when we're talking about opioid, so heroin is an opioid. Um, and, like and fentanyl, I would imagine, is a more expensive drug. And I would think um, people with better means would have it, or maybe I'm wrong. Heroin is is more expensive if you have pure heroin. And what is happening is that heroin is being adulterated with fentanyl. And that yeah. is, you know, what is propelling a lot of the, the mortality or the deaths we see. So um, these opioid deaths, they, they don't discriminate across class. So it's not like, you know, crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. It's not, it, that's not the case this time. Okay. Thank you very Next much. Question. Uh, sorry, who who is this? Is that? Oh, oh Miss Masso, please go ahead. I have a question. Um, you talked about the the number of deaths or the number. There was like a ratio of, uh, as far as in Brooklyn in general. But what about in in this, the CB two district and the zip codes that CB two covers? Um, unfortunately, I don't have that information on hand for CB two particularly. Do you have a general sense about like how much downtown Brooklyn Fort Greene is part of the conversation? So, um, I mean, the New York City Department of Health may have drilled down, but for the purposes of this presentation, gotcha. I, I just captured yeah, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Gotcha. I understand. Thank you very right. much. And thank you for a great presentation. My pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, we greatly appreciate this, and we'll definitely keep this in mind when we discuss our initiatives going forward. Um, I want to move ahead in our agenda tonight, and just finally, thank you very much. Just once again, I really, really do appreciate your presentation, and, and we really do want to keep you guys engaged with us in the future. Um, moving along in our presentation, in our, in, in our evening, we have our liquor license review. The first item up is a new tavern wine, 61 Bergen Street, Talea. Do we have somebody here from that location? Hello. Ms. Hoffman. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for joining us. Um, My pleasure. Thanks for uh, putting us early. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're trying to move more expedited with our committee meeting. And in the course of doing that, I'd like to ask you all to try to uh, produce present the most pertinent facts and we have seven minutes total allotted for this application so if you could please try to just uh, hit the high points which I know you're good at doing um, hours outdoor seating uh, and, yeah. and such and we can go from there yeah this is an application for Talea Beer Inc um, they are a brewery and so this is an act this is an application for a, a, a manufacturer's on-premise like a tavern beer and wine license um, the actual brewery facility is in Williamsburg. So the hours of operation, um, we have an, a nightly close of uh, 11 p.m. Uh, Monday or Sunday through Thursday and uh, midnight Friday and Saturday. They may even close earlier than that, but that was sort of to give them cushion. Um, they do hope to uh, include uh, the DOT outdoor areas. And so that looks like it was eight tables and 22 seats looks like um, what it would fit. Um, and I think the outdoor hours, which go back up, I think we had 9 p.m. for outdoor space. Okay. Thank you. I guess 10, uh, 10 p.m. I guess looks like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, if I stand corrected. Um, otherwise, this is the space that was 61 Berg and it's had a beer and wine license um, for quite some time. When do you all plan to open? Hi, do you want me to answer that, LT? Yeah, go ahead. This is Leanne. Leanne is one of the owners of Talia. Hi, um, happy to be here. Very excited to be in the neighborhood soon. Um, our goal is to start construction in December and to open uh, by the end of April 2022. Great. Um, how, how many people do you plan to hire? Um, likely between around 15 
Um, most will be part-time hourly and then probably two or three full-time salary. Great. Um, I noticed that there were residents who live above, but they have not been contacted. There was a notice posted. Um, was, was there any reasoning behind not contacting the residents? Uh, there are not residents directly above us. There are residents um, to the to the right of the building, and it's the same management um, of that property as it is of our bar. And I believe they've been notified. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The question sort of said in the building or adjacent. Right. To, and There's this a... is actually a sort of a you know this one doesn't have uh, units above. Okay. Yeah. What questions from members of the committee? Ms. Anadu. Sorry, um, mute issues. Um, so obviously this is not at all um, a condition of your uh, getting your liquor license, but you know, just obviously as, as job opportunities are created in the district, um, we, we really wanna make sure that um, opportunities that we're supporting brown and black communities where we can um, as they're being left behind in many cases. And so just encourage you to where you can hire locally, hire from the community, um, you know, and particularly if there are opportunities in the salaried roles, not just the hourly roles. But again, not a condition, just putting that out there, but good luck with your space. It looks, looks great. Thank you. I appreciate that. We are striving for better diversity. Right now we do have about 70% women at our current facility in Williamsburg, which I invite you all to attend. Um, about 30% are LGBTQIA+. Uh, but only about 15% are people of color. So, but absolutely that's a, a prior priority for us and keeping it local. I notice you guys are, will be rather proximate to uh, Wyckoff Gardens and some public housing. And it'd be great if, if there could be, and while it has no bearing on your application, if you can make a concerted effort to try to hire from that community, because not only is it convenient for them, but there's probably a widespread um, need for employment. Sure, yeah. Would love to follow up with you all as we get closer to hiring and make sure that we're covering all the grounds there. Other questions from the committee? And my view has changed, so can't see everybody at once. Now I can. Um, Mr. Newmark? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, sounds like a really interesting place. Um, I just wanted clarification first, which is um, are there residents in the building or in any area immediately adjacent to the proposed site? Uh, the, the, the applicant said not in the building, that the residents are adjacent. Was that correct? That's correct, on one side of the building. Okay, <clears throat> and I, I noticed in the application, if I so remember it correctly, that although your kitchen's gonna be closing at, um, I think, 11 on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, you would be, um, playing music until 12 on those nights? Um, that's correct. Again, we're not sure if we'll stay open that late. We currently, in our location in Williamsburg, close at 10. Um, but we would still have music on in the background in our space. No, no live music or DJ or anything, just on the speakers. OK. Um, uh, my other question, I guess I'll actually reserve for uh, the discussion that the committee will have. Thank you. OK. Great, thank Brent, you. Uh, any Brandon, questions? This, Mr. Varela, go quick, ahead. I, yeah, I just want to note that on the application itself, although we know the answer to this now, I couldn't find the address. And I know it's at where 61 Local used to be, but that part of the application was left blank. And so I just was looking for 87 Richardson, which I realized was in Williamsburg and not the right address. No, it's, I don't, 60, it's 61 Bergen Street. Right. But I don't so see that anywhere on the application. Just putting that out there. I'll okay. take a look if there is. <laughs> That's that. That's correct. It does say 87 Richardson. If you can uh, submit a revised application that includes those details, that would be great. I also noticed online that the, the hours are consistent with the hours of 61 Bergen, which uh, was the prior establishment there. Um, any questions from members of the community or the board for this application?
Hearing none. Oh, I'm sorry. Just one. Go ahead, Mr. Quick Mr. question. Um, I'm asking Latrell's question. Uh, is it is the space ADA accessible? I, I'm curious about the. There's a second floor, right? There is a second floor. The main floor is ADA accessible. We are going to be doing renovations on the facade to open it up a bit more. Okay. Um, but the mezzanine area likely will not, I don't think we have the budget to install a, an elevator to make right. that ADA accessible, uh, but we'll make sure the experience is, is the same on both levels. Thank you. I just wanted to note that the office received a letter of support from one of the neighbors and that someone in the chat who lives directly next door is in full support of Talia opening. We miss having a local cafe bar next door to us. Just wanted to make sure that's noted. Thank you, Ms. Church. That's great. We appreciate that we are comprehensive in getting everyone's feedback. Um, with all of these points noted, does anyone wish to make a motion on the application? Alejandro had a question in the chat. I'm not sure if he wanted to get that answered before we vote, but just wanted to call that out because he has food in his mouth and just needs a second. So I'm kind of stalling. Ms. Darlin, do, do you happen to know what happened to 61 local? Um, I, I don't I don't know that tenant um, personally, so I don't want to make any comments on what happened Fair. there. My apologies. It wasn't meant for the group. I was responding directly to the, the, the community member but who mentioned it. My apologies. Take it back. <laughs> Okay. Anyone would like to make a motion? Uh, Ms. McKnight, is that a motion to approve? Yes, motion to approve. I second. Um, any uh, discussion on the motion? Mr. Newmark. Thank you. Um, I reserve this for this discussion. Um, I, I, I think it's a Sounds like a great idea, and I'm glad that some residents are enthusiastic about it. Um, I'm just wondering if we'd like to amend the uh, motion to approve with a slight change in hours, if it would be acceptable to the uh, proprietor, so that we uh, can have a bit of an earlier closing on Thursday um, night, since that's the next day is still school, and, and there may be some children who live in either of the two buildings that are immediately adjacent to the property. I just went on Google Maps and, and saw a picture of it. So um, that's up to the committee to, to decide if we want to ask for that amendment. So just to get it clear with you, Barry, are you the, the time that I'm seeing on the application is an 11 p.m. closing with 10 p.m. outdoor closing currently. Are, are you asking for that time to be earlier? Uh, I'm asking for both to be earlier on Thursday night, since kids still go to school on Fridays. Okay. Um, any other points from the committee, Ms. Thurston? I'll just add, I don't mean to disagree with you, Barry. I just, I've loved that space and having it be open till that hour has been really helpful when I've had, like, I've had a bunch of political meetings there till that time and have never found it to spill out on the street or anything. I know this is a different venue, but it's one of those that to me seems um, good to go with the hours as stated, but just my opinion. I would just note in addition to Jessica's comment, 61 Local has still got their website up and they were open according to their website at least until midnight on Thursday, which seems to be an hour later than this applicant. So I, I would I would kind of side a little bit more with Jessica, but that's just my opinion. I'm not suggesting that if there are others who feel differently. Anyone else who has a, has a comment for discussion from the committee? Ms. McKnight, are you, are you, do you have any changes you want to make to your motion? No. Okay. All right. I'd like to take a vote then on this item. Um, Ms. McKnight, how do you vote? Approve. Okay. I vote to approve. Ms. Thurston, how do you vote? Approve. <laughs> Ms. Anadu? Approve. Uh, Mr. Newmark? Approve. Uh, Mr. Varela? Approve. Ms. Cobb, thank you. I'm sorry Approve. I don't recognize you yet. We're trying to go a little faster tonight. Um, how do you vote? Approve. Um, Approve. Thank you. 
Mr. Andrews, how do you vote? We'll come back to you. Ms. Einhorn, how do you vote? Approve. Okay. I don't think I missed anybody except for Mr. Andrews. We'll see if he chimes in. Um, otherwise, I believe that is a unanimous approval. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck Thanks with so your much. establishment. Look forward to meeting you all. We're really excited. Good luck. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Just a note, we, during that past presentation, we're joined by Ms. Cobb, who's a member of the committee and the board, and Mr. Andrews, who is a member of the board and the committee. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, yeah, I think you joined actually earlier. I just, this is my first time seeing you on these rotating squares, um, but uh, we'll move along to the next application. The, Next item is 55 Water Street, Purple Fett. We're on the new full on-premise. Do we have somebody here from that location? Uh, yes, my name is Ben Savitsky from Bernstein Rado for Purple Fett. Okay. I'll give you um, a, a, a quick overview. Uh, James Fantacci is on as well. He is the owner and he's gonna to speak to the operations a little bit. So um, this so is- Just Purple before Fett. you do, we need to keep the uh, presentation and the questions to about six minutes for this application. So if you can try to hit, hit it in about two to three minutes, including what's the update, because this was just before us uh, a few months ago. You got it. So that's all. I'll keep it as short as possible due to that. So uh, same application that was here back in April. Unfortunately, we actually got your support on the application is for a wine bar. Um, we received your support. We received the full board support. We actually filed with the New York State Liquor Authority for a premises at 55 Water Street. Unfortunately, the landlord decided to move in a different direction for that space. They did give us another location in the building. This is on Old Dock Street, but it's still part of the 55 Water Street complex. Same application, same operations. Uh, Purple Fed is a multifaceted concept that's composed of a, uh, a wine shop and a wine bar. The wine shop, which we're not here for tonight, it's a different application, is going to have 56 wines, and it's going to be a uh, wine that you go into the, the shop. Uh, you give your flavor profile by tasting different wines and James and his staff kind of select uh, the best wines for you and you have an option to purchase them. The wine bar, which we're here for tonight, is an extension of that. They're going to have the 56 wines that are available in the shop and they're going to highlight them as part of the wine bar as well as other beverages. The interior hours that we're looking for are the exact same that were approved by you guys uh, back in April. Uh, it is uh, mid noon to midnight, Sunday through Wednesday, and 1 a.m. on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Outside, we're on Old Dock Street, so we're not on Water Street. We're looking for an 11 p.m. close during the week, meaning Sunday through Wednesday, and midnight on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, the restaurant's only going to have recorded background music. They're going to close any operable windows by 10 p.m. nightly. And this application has the support of the Dumbo Bid, as well as some other organizations, uh, water.org. Um, and uh, we think it's going to be great for the neighborhood, and we hope that you guys support it again. Great. Thank you very much for the presentation. Now, just for clarification, the hours that we approved at the April meeting, because I have the April minutes in front of me, uh, are the same indoors, but for outdoors, you're looking to go an hour later on the outdoors between uh, Sunday and Wednesday, and uh, an hour later on Thursday through Saturday uh, due to um, moving to a different location, Old Dock Street instead of Water Street. And for everyone's recollection, there were no community concerns expressed at that meeting about this application, but we felt because Water Street was somewhat of a, a, a narrow street that it was appropriate to have a, a, an earlier closing time for the outdoor seating, uh, given the juncture on that street. I'm not saying we should necessarily take the, the latest request in any differently, but, that, but that's my recollection about what, what I have and, and it's reflected in the, in the minutes. Um, that's 100% correct. And the, and the reason that we're asking for the hour later, which is what we wanted originally, um, is because we are on Old Dock Street and there's no residential there. And it's, a, you know, it's, it's kind of to itself. Um, and you know, with COVID uh, and people are still a little bit um, skeptical about dining inside. They'd rather dine outside. You know, we could use all the hours that we can get um, for outdoor dining. Okay. Questions from members of the committee?
So just to be clear, Alejandro here, Brandon, may I? Go ahead. So just to be clear, the the outdoor dining will be in that alley on, on Dock Street, right? That is correct. Okay. And it will be, of course, like any outdoor dining, it will be surrounded by, we're going to use planters to kind of set it off from Old Dock Street. And I think there is also a plan to kind of beautify Old Dock Street a little bit as part of this application, because we want people to have a good experience out there. And you can see that's kind of uh, what we're going for. It's going to be an elegant space. It's going to be sophisticated, but it's also going to be approachable. Yeah, uh, to that end, hi, this is James. Uh, we're going to add some public seating and, and plantings outside as well. Okay, James, I'm sorry. Could we just get your last name for the minutes? Antachi. Thank you. And what is your role with the uh, location? I'm, I'm the founder and owner. Okay, great. Thank you very much for coming. It's great to have folks like uh, in that capacity at, at our meeting. Um, any questions from members of the public or board members for this application? Just um, Emily. Sorry. Yes, Anadu, sorry. Hi, no problem. I know your screen view has changed. Um, so yeah, I would just say that similar to the comments um, that were made for the last location, um, the proximity to several NYCHA housing projects, and again, not a condition or required as part of your application, um, but we do encourage um, just hiring locally, um, similar to the comments that were made on the last one, the proximity to, um, again, several NYCHA housing projects just makes an attractive like job offer because close um, and obviously the need is there. So we just encourage um, the hiring brown and black and particularly reaching out locally. So just encourage. Yeah. And so the good thing about this application is because we're doing two licenses here, a wine shop and also the wine bar, we're looking at about 30 employees. James has already spoken about uh, we're working with the bid and we do plan on hiring locally. Additionally, uh, once per quarter, we're going to allow um, charities, uh, pr principally local charities, to be able to use our space for fundraising without charging them for using the space, which um, I've been told by a lot of charities, including some that are supporting us, that that's one of the hardest things to do, which is find space where uh, they can hold these events, especially something as, as beautiful as this, uh, where you know they don't have to pay for it and eat into the actual uh, money that they, they're trying to raise for their own cause. So uh, we want to be part of the community in that fashion as well. Thank but, you very much. Yeah. And Mr. Antachi, Mr. Savitsky, um, will there be somebody on site at the restaurant at all times to address any concerns that are raised by community members about potential noise from the outdoor cafe? So yes, James, I'll let you handle that. Yeah, so uh, our, our GM is, is the former assistant GM from Per Se, very high level of service. And, you know, we, we expect and we want to be a good community member to everyone. Uh, so uh, for sure, that, that'll be, there'll always be someone on hand, a uh, management from a manager perspective, both the store and the uh, wine bar. Okay, that's great. I'm certainly Per Se is an elegant establishment but i'm not sure if they have an outdoor space or can appreciate the the uh experiences that the folks in dumbo can um any other comments or questions for this application hearing none would anyone like to make a motion miss nadu what what is your motion motion to approve this application okay yeah uh, do we have a second Second. Second from Ms. Cobb. Does, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, um, I will uh, proceed to take a vote. Um, and just to under, understand, I, I, I think it's fair to say the committee would expect that you would have somebody on site to address any concerns that community members would would um, raise as a condition of the app of the of the vote. Um, with that said, uh, Ms. Thurston, how do you vote? In favor. Okay, I vote in favor. Ms. Anadu, how do you vote? In favor. Mr. Varela. Oh, yeah. In favor. Sure. In favor. Uh, Mr. Newmark. In favor. Ms. Cobb. Favor. Favor. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Andrews. We'll come back to him if, if we need to. Ms. Einhorn. 
In favor. Great. Um, did I miss anyone? Ms. Church, did I miss anybody? I don't think so. Um, with that said, your motion is approved. Uh, thank you all very much. Good luck with uh, the opening. I hope it goes better on Dock Street than it did on Water. And uh, um, we, uh, we you. wish you uh, uh, success in, in, your, in your ventures there. Great. Um, thank you all. Thanks very much. I hope to see you there. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we're uh, happy and pleased to be joined by Ms. Carolyn uh, Hubbard coming and weary, who's a board member. I uh, just wanted to acknowledge you. I don't have enough time to have you formally introduce yourself, but we appreciate you coming to the meeting as we appreciate all board members. Good evening, everyone. Us. Good evening. Um, next up, we've got our second full on premise, 445 Gold Street, Alamo Draft House. We have somebody here from that location. Going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, next up, we have 852 Fulton Street, Fulton Bean Company, Ohala Authentic Mexican. Do we have someone here from that location? Good evening. My name is William Lemus, and I am representing Ohala. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. Like the last application, we would like to try to keep this within about six minutes. So if you can try to hit the high points, we'll come at, we'll come back with any uh, pertinent questions. Thank you. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to establish a restaurant that will be family orientated. Um, you know, we just want people to, from the community to come in and support us and have a great time at our small little restaurant. Uh, right now we have about 20 plus employees. You know, we'll be hiring more from the neighborhood, obviously. We do ask some of the customers from the neighborhood, you know, if they had someone that's looking for work, send us our way to continue to grow our team. Our hours are operating gonna be, you know, we open at 12 o'clock. Right now we close at 10. In the near future, we will ask if we can extend the hour, our business hours, at least another hour or so on the weekends. We have a beautiful backyard that we're trying to really push even now in the winter time so people can come in and enjoy it. I will also add, I believe we, uh, we requested a couple of uh, photos to be put in as well. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have access to those. No, I don't have um, that location. Uh, we, we had uh, sent uh, to Carol. I, I don't know if it's that, that second or that fourth tab there that says supporting. No. No, that's just an email of support. Oh, okay. Um, we, we, yeah, I'm sorry. We, we had submitted them to Carol Ann, but I guess it, it might not have made it in here. Um, but well, we had, aside from William, what was your name? I, oh, I'm sorry, I, my name is Daniel. Yeah. And what's your last name, Daniel? Uh, Nasser. Nasser. Okay, thank you for for joining. And what is your role with the establishment? Um, so I actually also own my my brother's uh, one of the uh, partners here at the restaurant. I've just been helping them out, uh, especially since it's uh, um, uh, our first year in here with them as well. I own a business over on Vanderbilt, but obviously as they began to grow, I wanted to be here support them as well to kind of uh, get business up on, on its feet. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm sorry, back to the uh, point I was trying to make earlier. Uh, we had tried to put in a picture of just kind of uh, how much we've done to kind of improve the business, um, including the backyard. We had, uh, there was like nothing there but grass. Um, we put um, a lot of time and effort into kind of like convert that to like an outdoor seating area back there. Um, it's, it's come together really well, actually, and, and, and the uh, community has been uh, very supportive of that. Um, also provided was, uh, you know, obviously a bunch of uh, signatures of support from the neighborhood. Um, I, I heard people obviously, you know, mentioning the concern of tenants upstairs as well as adjacent to us. We've, we've uh, gone ahead and spoken to all of those and 
provided uh, you know documentation from them as well in support of us um, uh, opening up. So, or excuse me, serving the alcohol. Um, we've we've been about just about a, a year and two months now. Actually, today would make our 14 month anniversary, um, and uh, have done an amazing job of trying to keep afloat. But of course, um, if we can find another way to kind of um, maintain our presence in the neighborhood, I think this would be the best approach. Great. Thanks. Um, I, I see that you're, you've got the outdoor space 10 p.m. Are any of the residents directly overseeing, abutting the, the, the uh, backyard space? And this is just a backyard space. There's no space on the street or a open sidewalk cafe or, or something like that. Yeah, no, unfortunately, because the uh, bus lane, the hours of the, uh, I think it's between 2 and 7 p.m., it makes it hard to kind of set up and break down between that period. Um, so we've decided to just stick to having the backyard space. Um, and, the, you know, the tenants ab directly above uh, do have site down there. But again, we've uh, gotten actually um, really well expressed um, support from them to uh, do this. Great. I know that we received a email in support of this application, which states a uh, person lives on Gates Avenue. Um, as a community member, I would love to get Ohala approved for a liquor license, super great food that could be improved with beer or margarita. Um, that's the only feedback that I'm aware of. Have, any, can, have, have there been any um, outstanding concerns beyond those that you've already spoken with the residents um, and resolved? Have there been any, are there any outstanding concerns by residents expressed to you? No, uh, on the contrary, we've been, we've received nothing but overwhelming support from everybody. Um, okay. and, and as I'm sure, you know, as you guys do your research and, and thankfully having built our reputation over the last 12, 14 months, like I said, um, we have overwhelming support online and everybody says that the one thing um, in the reviews that, that we're missing would be the, uh, the liquor license. So we're hoping to kind of come, you know, come through on that promise for them. Great. Questions from members of the committee? Ms. Thurston? Yes, uh, I, I noticed that you're missing the alcohol hours explicitly. And um, you'll know that in the other applications, there was like a line where you have those hours that says alcohol. So I would just perhaps work with your attorney or just edit it yourselves and just clarify that you want to keep these same hours just for alcohol, just so it's in the form the SLA expects. And, and related to the hours point, you noted that you may want to extend your hours. Just a recommendation, you might want to ask for that tonight um, and you can amend your application so that we can discuss it now. It doesn't mean you need to extend your hours, but it saves you a trip back to us um, to ask for that. I can't guarantee we'll approve it, but you may as well make the ask now if you'd like to, just a, just a thought. And we so, can the ask that in the yeah. near future, we can extend it to another hour, you know, instead of closing at 10, we close at 11. Yeah, I would say 11 during the week and then midnight on the weekends is ultimately what we're looking to achieve. Um, but, you know, given the circumstance, under the circumstances now going into the winter, that's why we didn't think to do it right now. But, uh, but thank you. That's actually a great point. So if we can make that request to um, extend those hours to that. Um, also, let it be known that part of the process when we were um, getting signatures from everybody, we did also mention that so that nobody felt as though we were um, purposely, you know, putting a, a lower uh, close or an earlier close time now to later increase it. But so we did get approval for or from or at least uh, support from the neighborhood on that as well. Okay. When when you say eleven and twelve, are you saying that in respect to the indoor only, or in respect to the indoor and the outdoor? Um. So I would say both. Um. But I know that. Uh, the community, especially during the week, does not want kind of like that excessive noise in the backyard. Um, so I think we, we could we could work around that and, and of course, um, kind of reel it in as the night goes on and, and have an earlier close in the backyard. Um, if okay. we see that. Well, we can take that up in the committee discussion. Um, any other questions from members of the committee for the application? Just want to make sure I'm noting this in the minutes correctly. So you'd like it to be until 11 p.m. Monday through Friday? Or Monday, Sunday through Monday, Thursday? Sunday to Thursday, 12 to 11, and then Friday, Saturday, um, uh, 12 to 12. And that's indoor. And then say again what you want outdoors? We, we can reel it in by a half an hour on the, out, on the outside uh, section as well. Okay. 
Um, any other questions from members of the committee? Any questions from members of the community or board members? Um, seeing none. Do you hear me? Oh, I have uh, Mr. Varela, go ahead. Can you hear me? I can no. now. I heard yeah, when okay. you said, can you hear me? All right, great. Um, just, I, I apologize uh, to, the, uh, to the applicants. Can you describe the, the backyard you said? Are there a lot of residents that feed into that? into that space windows uh so we're we're in the middle of the block um so we do have buildings directly next to us that kind of oversee that backyard if you will um and then further down the block um 840 uh 840 fulton has a it's a kind of like a, a high-rise building right there right right um, okay. so those are the ones and then we specifically made sure to get um support from everybody like those people that are affected by that including on clinton street who those residents share the backyard with us as well. Um, so you'll note in, you know, on the list of signatures that we made sure to include um, residents that share that backyard so that they, they were comfortable with it as well. Okay, thank you. Of course, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, does anybody want to make a motion? Ms. Nadu? A motion to approve this application. We have a second. Ms. Cobb seconds discussion on the motion. Um, do we feel that what what are the hours that, that we're comfortable with for the for the indoor and outdoor? I'm comfortable. Okay with an hour more on the outdoor as they ask. I mean the indoor as they ask, but on the outdoor, I think um, 10 p.m. is 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 perfectly fine. All seven days. Um, it seems to be, oh no, right now they have outdoor until midnight, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or am I looking at No, that? it's 10 p.m. seven days a week, but they proposed to do it a little bit later um, when we were just discussing it. Right, sorry, I had the, the purple FET one open just now, my apologies. Um, Jessica, no, I, I think, I, I, I know you were speaking too, so did you- No, no, to... that's fine. I was gonna say I'm fine with uh, the later outdoor hours, but I, I don't feel strongly 10, 10 p.m. every night is fine. I just feel like because the, the 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 applicants have discussed this with the community, and perhaps some of the members of the community are feeling like it's going to be 10 p.m. on the outdoors, and they might appreciate that. I, I'd suggest that we stick with 10 p.m. on the outdoors. Mr. Newmark, I agree with you, Mr. Smith. Any other thoughts from the committee before we vote? Uh, I'm sorry if I may just comment. Sorry, in which case... I just my question was for the committee. Any questions from the, or comments from the committee? Hearing none, before we vote, I, I will ask you you guys, um, the, the proposed hours for this application would be 11 p.m. Sunday to Thursday, 12 a.m. on Friday and Saturday night, indoors. Outdoors, it would be 10 p.m. seven days a week. Are you okay with that? Yeah, I, I think that that's great. Again, being that um, it's our first time with the liquor license, we, we'd wanna obviously ride that out for a while anyway, which is what our initial plan was. Um, and then, you know, come next spring, maybe, or something like that, if we feel that um, we need, you know, reconsideration on that, we can obviously follow the same process, um, talk to the community, make sure that they're, you know, that they're uh, uh, aware of that. And assuming that we can get their support, come back to you guys and, and, and reapproach that. Great. I think that that's a good course of action. Um, awesome. With that in mind, let's take a vote. Um, Ms. Thurston, how do you vote? In favor. I, I vote in favor. Ms. Anadu, how do you vote? In favor. Great. Um, Mr. Varela, how do you vote? In favor. Mr. Newmark, how do you vote? In favor. Uh, Ms. Cobb? In favor. Great. Uh, Ms. Einhorn? In favor. Excellent. And Mr. Andrews? Um, Mr. Andrews, you've been muted for the past few votes, so we're going to record you as an abstain. If you have any comments, feel, feel free to put it in the chat or let us know. Um, otherwise, I don't think I missed anybody and this motion is approved unanimously. Congratulations, guys. And we wish you the best of luck with your establishment. Good luck. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Thank you.
Um, before we leave, do we are, are we expected to get like a like a letter in response or something? Because again, I'm sorry, it's our first time. So do do we like wait on like a letter from you guys with the approval, or, or how does that work? So the letter is sent from the community board to the state liquor authority. Oh. Um, it, whether we have any additional contact with you, I, I'm not sure that we do. But but for the points in the application that we we spoke about, we would appreciate if you could update and send to the board office. Ms. Church, did you want to clarify anything? Sure. So what happens after this is it goes before the executive committee for ratification, and that meeting happens on the last Monday of this month. After, sometime after that, a letter will be issued to the state legal authority, and you will be copied on it. Excellent. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's much better than I could have said it, and 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 much more accurate. Appreciate it, Caroline. Um, next up on our evening is 84 Montague Street, Felice. Do we have somebody here from that location? Yes, you do, uh, Greg Giannone. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Giannone. Just like with the other applicants, if you can try to keep your presentation to a, a, a few minutes, we have about six minutes to address it. And uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to present. Okay, uh, we're uh, Felice Restaurants. Uh, we have uh, five in Manhattan. This will be our first one outside of Manhattan. Uh, looking forward to going to uh, Brooklyn. As you can see, our hours, uh, wow, that's a, a little different than I have it set up. Uh, you know, our latest that would be open is it's 11 o'clock and that's uh, Wednesday through Saturday. Uh, and that's the same hours we have at all of our other locations. Uh, we're a, you know, a, a wine bar concept of, with Italian food and, and wine. Uh, music is just background music. Uh, we always install uh, acoustic panels within uh, uh, the restaurants uh, to minimize any uh, noise. Uh, it's all commercial in that area, uh, or the building itself is. Uh, I don't know uh, if there's any. I, I, if there's anything else you think I should be addressing, uh, please. Uh, outdoor me. hours. They, it's outdoor is checked, but it's not on the application. What what is the outdoor portion of the restaurant, and what would be the time it closes? Uh, we would like to keep it the same hours as uh, uh, the hours of operation. Uh, and there is a seating uh, that is uh, part of the property line of the uh, restaurant that we'd be using. The existing seating is there. That was a, that was a restaurant, uh, a pre-existing restaurant. What was, was the name of the prior restaurant? I think it's Julia's, I think. Okay. And your current hours are closing at 10 p.m. on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, and 11 p.m. on Wednesday through Saturday? Correct. And I, as a part of whatever hours we agreed to, we would want you to correct this application to add the hours in the space where it says outdoors so that we have a correct record. Um, sure. Uh, but we can... Uh, Take it from here. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Uh, Mr. My Morella, I, I, I see your I see your your hand is raised. Mr. Um, Giannoni, is that correct? That's, that's, yes, that's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, you said it was Julius before. It wasn't Brooklyn Heights Cafe. I'm confused. Is it not the same spot? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I know the landlord because the landlord ran, operated the restaurant. So I guess what I'm curious about is you want to stay open, um, but it's, Caroline, it's not a cafe. It's, it's, the, it's the, the, the seating that's sort of within the, the, the line of the business. So it it's doesn't reach the, the point of cafe. I misunderstood or I didn't fully get what Mr. Giannone said. Is it a sidewalk cafe or is it within the property line? Uh, it's within the property line. Uh, we would try to avail ourselves of any of the New York City uh, open restaurant uh, seating that they're working on and finalizing post pandemic. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Chat says 80, 80 enthusiastic letters of support received for Felice and one brief note of unspecified objection. Somebody called me at 10 o'clock Sunday morning to uh, say how much they were looking forward to us coming. I mean, before I saw that, I guess my concern, Brandon, was that 
11, 11 p.m. It's a very residential spot, 11 p.m. outside. I, I'm, I'm above and beyond or apart from what's happening in, during the pandemic, which the outdoor seating, irrespective of that, I'm saying the, the side, the what would be sidewalk hours, I would be concerned 11 p.m. every single day, but I guess. Well, it's um, not 11 every single day, just uh, uh, Wednesday through Saturday. Taya or Carol Ann, what was the specific nature of the unspecified comment? It was extremely unspecific um, and brief, one second. And how was this submitted it's, to it's the simply, board? It simply said, please deny liquor license. We have many bars on Montague Street. We don't need another. The 80 enthusiastic letters of support were much longer and more specific. We're not a bar. Uh, we're more of a restaurant. Okay. Was this simply an email or, or, or a phone call or, or what was, how, how did this person get in touch with the board? They were all emails. They're all emails. Okay. And we, the person didn't indicate that they were a resident or, or where they were from. I understand it was not specific, but I just, if they were Correct. like the upstairs neighbor. No, no indication. Um, the majority of the letters of support indicated an immediate address or a street. The one letter of objection just says, we have many bars on Mount Street. It wasn't more specific. Okay. This is the same location as Heights Cafe. So it would be that same seating that was in the area outside of Heights Cafe. Mr. Newmark? Yes. Yeah, I wanted to say it was Heights Cafe uh, once removed. It was Julia's uh, after Heights Cafe uh, went out of business. And Julia's only stayed there for a short while. Um, and I can understand the 80 letters of support because uh, Ju um, both the Heights Cafe and Julia's were always packed with people. If you have good food and good stuff to drink in that location, uh, you're going to do very, and good service, you're going to do very well. And I know the area very, very well. And there are really almost no residential uh, locations of people living in the immediate uh, vicinity of where that corner on Hicks and Montague Street is. Um, there's a school upstairs. Um, there's uh, businesses. Um, and normally, as you remember from the first discussion, I don't like outdoor spaces being open very late, but I really can't see uh, the outdoor spaces in this location being a problem to anybody. And in fact, it'll be a boon to that part of the street, which is a little dark and, and doesn't have any businesses like this um, and, and on that stretch. So I'm, I'm make me the 81st enthusiastic. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Newmark, and thank you for clarifying when it was Brooklyn uh, <laughs> Cafe. You're welcome. Okay. And I, I do I, I do see it's uh, three locations within 500 feet, so it would be subject to 500 foot rule, but um, that, that's a matter more for the liquor authority than for us. Um, any other questions for Mr. Giannone? Janoni from the uh, committee or from the community or any board members. Hearing none, um, does anyone wish to make a motion for this application? Mr. Newmark, what's your motion? Yeah, I move we, so we approve the uh, application as, uh, as provided to us with the changes that were suggested that Mr. Gioni needs to make to the alcohol hours. Okay, I second. Uh, any discussion on the motion? No discussion, just for some fairness, I'll go in reverse order this time. Ms. Einhorn, how do you vote? Maybe we'll come back to Ms. Einhorn. Um, Mr. Andrews. Apologies, I wasn't ready because I always go last. I, yeah. I, I, I vote to approve. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll come back to you, Mr. Andrews. Uh, Mr. Newmark, how do you vote? I vote to approve. Okay. I approve. Oh, Victor, do you also approve of the prior applications that we Yes. We had? Yes. Great. Great. Yes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Anadu, how do you vote? I approve. 
Um, Mr. Varela, how do you vote? In favor. I, I vote in favor. Ms. Thurston, how do you vote? In favor. Excellent. Uh, it's unanimous. Uh, good luck in your new establishment, Mr. Giannone. Um, Thank you very much. Hiring, local hiring, local hiring. We I, Restaurants can't be uh, very picky these days. <laughs> if there are local people to be hired, we will definitely be looking at them. <laughs> the we encourage you to is. contact Fort Green Snap, Ingersoll Community Center, and Brooklyn Navy Yard. You, you perhaps you, you if you if you contact those locations, you'll you'll find some folks who are able to 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 be um, your your staff. And you know, to Mr. Varela's point, we we really appreciate, and we've already voted on this, so this obviously doesn't have a bearing on your vote. You you, we want we want to see more representation from uh, people of color and people from uh, different socioeconomic communities within the restaurants in our neighborhoods, because we, we, we don't always see that in, in restaurants around here. And, and there are lots of people who, who do need employment in our community. Anything to add, Alejandro? We could wipe out unemployment with the restaurants alone. If uh, somebody could send me uh, the uh, locations or uh, that you just mentioned, uh, Brandon, I'd appreciate it. If the board I can pass it along to our HR okay. department. Excellent. We we would love for it. We would love to see that. And you know, I, I don't live so far away, so I, I'm going to come to check you out eventually, and and hopefully we'll we'll see a nice uh, diverse experience there. We will um, do the best we can. Wonderful. All right. Thank you very much, and good luck. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. All right. That concludes our new licenses for the evening. We're up to renewals. We have 77 Sand Street, Randolph Beer. 219 DeKalb Avenue, Colonial Verde, 930 Fulton Street, Otway, 1015 Fulton Street, Nessa Corp, 286 Livington Street, Burger Village, uh, Ms. Church, um, or, or Ms. Muller, um, do you have, any, have we received any complaints from members of the community uh, about these uh, renewals within the past two years? There are none. Okay. I don't have, there's nothing on record. Great. Thank you. Any members of the community, the board or the committee have any concerns to express about these, these, uh, these different establishments? Hearing none, I'm just going to note that for 77 Sand Street, Randolph Beer, while our committee did approve their initial application, the executive committee voted against the application before it was um, uh, before it was sent out due to concerns about them operating before their they were licensed and the potential for underage drinking relative to a beer wall at the location. Subsequently, they've opened. The liquor authority granted their license, and we've approved their renewal uh, application since that point. I just want to make sure we note the full record of our involvement with the location because I, I recall all of it as I was present at all of those meetings. Um, any motion to be made on the renewals? Mr. Neymar. I approve all of them. <laughs> um, and I'll take that as a second from Mr. Andrews. So Mr. Newmark with the motion to approve and Mr. Andrews with the second. Um, any discussion from the uh, committee on the motion? Hearing none, um, Ms. Einhorn, how do you vote? Sorry to surprise you again. Um, Mr. Andrews, how do you vote? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Um, We've been joined by Mr. Harrison. Um, do you abstain on this application, Mr. Harrison, as you've just joined the meeting? No. Do you have a vote? I vote yes. Okay. Um, Ms. Cobb, how do you vote? To approve. Mr. Newmark, how do you vote? I approve. Ms. Nadu, how do you vote? Approve. Mr. Varela, how do you vote? 
In favor. I vote in favor. Ms. Thurston, how do you vote? In favor. I think Ms. McKnight has left the meeting, um, but I, I think I also got everybody. So it's unanimous on the approvals. Next on the agenda, chairperson's report. Um, for the chairperson's report this evening, I, I just want to note a couple of different things that we've got upcoming. And because we're moving pretty good on our schedule, I'll note something about our prior meeting with National Grid and Con Edison. Um, I, I think with regard to future meetings, we're going to have, we're going to see the Department of Health come back in the next month or two, uh, for hopefully a COVID update. We can discuss if we want to have any motions related to COVID in our other business section. Um, we, I, in the interim between the last meeting and this one, I followed up with Yeka about the asthma project because we're supposed to have an update here in the fall about the asthma project. And um, I anticipate that at a future Yeka meeting, we'll, we'll schedule an update with district 13 and 15 about how that's been going with them. Just wanna make sure everybody's in the loop about that. Um, aside from that, I just wanna note about the National Grid and Con Edison presentations that I, I, I updated the minutes from last time, which are available on the share drive with like a point by point commentary on everything that they said. I would encourage everybody to go back and look it over. I know the presentation was a little hard to follow because there was so much data and so much discussion there, but I think it's worth considering whether we should have a meeting in the future on really zeroing in on the net zero 2050 goal that they had at National Grid, because I didn't get the feeling that there was a ton of details provided about the specific nature of that plan and why it's going to take until 2050. There was a lot of discussion about um, this is complex. This is going to require analysis that, and that they will come back and, and they, are, they did say that they will provide to us their 2020 uh, priorities uh, that, that whether they complied with them or not. So I'm hopeful that we'll get that offline from them. Um, hopefully that's something that we can discuss and bring back in the spring. I think that's about it though that I wanna note for my chairperson report tonight. Um, going to move ahead in the agenda. Oh, and I just want to also note one more thing, which is on Monday, we have a hearing, which is uh, we have a, a town hall with uh, Department of Social Services and uh, these proposed homeless shelters that are coming in. As I mentioned earlier in the meeting, I think we should defer any conversation about this to the, to the town hall uh, because we have a whole meeting about it. Uh, but I would encourage everybody from the committee to attend if you can, because it's going to be a discussion related to our subject matter of social services, and uh, it, it, it will be helpful to everybody's in education on the subject, as well as a showing of the community board's investment in this issue uh, for everyone to show up. Um, so hopefully you've got the invitation at 7 p.m. on Monday, and we'll look forward to seeing you there. Um, other business. Does anyone have any items of other business they want to raise? I think Alejandro's hand is up. Okay. And then I, want to, Gary. I want to comment on what you said about the utility companies and their plan and, and hold, sort of holding them to account and just uh, just, a, just a, a bit of appreciation that you're doing that and that you're saying that. And I think it really is important. Um, I don't think we should let our foot off the gas when it comes to this. I think we're already suffering the effects of climate change, it is only gonna get worse and scarier every season, every year. Um, and, you know, every municipality in this, in this country, but in the world has one or two people who are sort of pushing and pushing and pushing and collectively it will make a difference. So I'm, I'm very grateful that you are, that you want to follow up on this. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Alejandro. Mr. Newmark? Yeah, I, what I, my, my topic doesn't, uh compare with what you just discussed and what Alejandro just discussed. I, I agree with them completely, but getting off that major topic for a moment, 
I keep asking this question and maybe it gets lost in all the different emails that, that are received. Uh, I've noticed a few months back, and I'm not sure how long this has been the case, that the description of our committee um, describes us as dealing with mental health issues. And I don't understand why it doesn't have health issues as being our mandate. It could say health issues, including mental health. That would be great because sometimes mental health is not noticed and as a professional um, in that field, I appreciate that notice, but we, we deal with health issues as well. So I'm not quite sure why the description is written that way. And I would hope that it could be made more clearly available to people so they would understand what our mission is. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Church, anything to say from a board office perspective on Mr. Newmark's comment? Okay. No, it looks I, like it. It. I think it was probably written by the former um, district manager okay excellent um we we can take that up offline barry thanks for noticing and pointing it out um i see miss einhorn's hand is raised and i saw i thought i saw miss masso but masso miss masso must have her hand down now um but let me know if you want to put your hand up and i also saw mr harrison um miss einhorn um, so in support of the conversation about global warming, there's been a lot of reports about um, the percentage of recycling that's actually being recycled. Um, and I wonder if we might devote some committee time to discussing how within the district we can support efforts that might um, use recycling in the district in different and interesting ways. Um, and I've seen other communities do this, but um, it might be worth a, a larger discussion. And then I also wanted to circle back to the COVID um, points for Department of Health, um, namely whether the committee might be interested in partnering with Department of Health to get um, a local, to, to work on a local vaccine initiative, um, specifically an event, um, as we might be able to promote in new and interesting ways that they haven't thought of before. Yeah, I think that, that 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 could be an interesting idea. We'll take the recycling comments up in the in the in the uh, intervening period between this and the next meeting. But with and, and we'll we'll look at potentially uh, seeing how we can incorporate that into a future agenda. But with respect to the COVID nineteen points, uh, Latrell had actually contacted me in between the meetings and had an idea had a great idea which I I wanted to see if what if the broader committee had any thoughts about and. Um, Perhaps I can give Latrell the floor quickly to talk about that, and and then we can try to wrap it up with John's comment, and then um, I think hopefully that should be it for other business. Uh, Latrell. Hi, um, I was thinking about doing about we doing a health fair because we we talk so much about different topics on the committee. I thank you for letting me join and sitting on the committee for the last, I think a year, a year plus, just sitting in with you guys. I greatly appreciate you and let, letting me feel a part of the committee. Um, but I was thinking about a health fair because we talk about a wide range of topics and instead of just sharing it, keep it with us and people who join in, out, join in you know, the different meetings, but take it out into the community. I hope I'm explaining it correctly, like take it out to the community and do a fair so the community can see the different topics that we feel that's important and that we should bring to the community to help support them. Thanks, thanks, Latrell. And I th think to fully do justice to your email, um, you mentioned that the we could we could help bring some element of testing and vaccines to to this fair, and uh, potentially if there are interested folks in the committee, there could be a, a subgroup to work on it at some point in the spring. I think it would be helpful to see if there's members of the committee who might be interested in working on this with Latrell. Um, if you are, if you can just sort of raise your hand or indicate that, it would be, it would be great. We could potentially take it forward. Um, I see Ms. Nadu is interested. Um, I, I'll of course be interested. I see Ms. Thurston is interested and Ms. Einhorn is interested. Um, if anyone else is interested, please feel free to contact myself, uh, Ms. McKnight, Ms. Thurston, Ms. Church, and we'll 
be absolutely planning something, I hope, for uh, something to take forward. I think it's good if we potentially take it away and, and try to come up with a, a defined concept, and then we'll bring it back to the committee and have a, a, vo a vote on our defined concept. Um, any further thoughts on that from anyone or Latrell? Hey, Brandon, I just wanted to remind us and maybe get the, the office to remind us. I think there's uh, rules on subcommittees in terms of the numbers, and I think we might have gone over. Uh, uh, on what? Subsidies is what I heard. When we create, uh, if we're creating a subcommittee, then there's like official rules that we have to follow. But if it's not a subcommittee and we keep it to a low number of people, um, then we're able to have more meetings with uh, less rules and regulation. And so it's just. Right, we're not creating a subcommittee and we're not going to create any form of uh, formalized group as a result of this. I, I just feel like it would be helpful to have uh, people who are interested um, chat offline and then come back to this group where we'll actually conduct business about it so we can try to do this in an efficient manner. Um, I, I think though that means we're not allowed to have more than four people participate um, if board office can confirm. Okay, we'll look into that point as well too. Um, thank you very much for raising it. Uh, Mr. Harrison, you also had a comment. Thanks for waiting. If you, if you weren't here at the beginning of the meeting, but if you could uh, if, if you could note, we're trying to have a bit of an expedited meeting tonight. So if you could provide your comment, try to keep it uh, somewhat short, that would be very much appreciated. Sure, Brandon. I, I think I fully support an expedited meeting. I'm very impressed that by the time I, I got here, 99% of this meeting is done. Um, I, I fully support having their, your discussion on the, um, with ComEd and with the other um, providers, that it's kind of a concentrated meeting. I think that would help to concentrate the discussion and help to not water it down with a whole lot of things on agenda. Um, the other thing I have to say is I'm, I'm fully aware of and I'm supportive and, and plan on joining the meeting with my department on Monday. I just have to be very careful I can't, I almost have to recuse myself from any uh, opinion or any discussion because I work with them. Okay. Thanks for noting that, John. Um, yep. Any other comments or, or, or uh, proposals for other business? <sighs> Hearing none, we have community forum. Any members of the community, uh, non board members? who have a, a statement or a, a point that they would like to make at tonight's meeting. Mr. Smith, uh, a representative from the NYC CCRB is online. Ms. Banegas, did you have a comment? Oh, yeah, I did. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry. I was having trouble looking for the um, raised hand feature. Um, but yeah, I'm an outreach coordinator at the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board. And if this is your first time hearing about the CCRB, we're a city agency that investigates police misconduct. So if someone has an interaction with an officer where um, excessive or unnecessary force was used, if there was an abuse of authority, discourtesy, or offensive language, people can file a complaint with the CCRB and we would investigate. Um, if possible, I'd like to share um, information about the agency and also let people know that our next monthly board meeting is going to be on November 18th and it's going to be virtual on WebEx and I can share the link um, to register as well. Okay, that, that's you. great. Feel free to share that in, in the chat and thanks for coming and speaking to us. Um, we, Ms. Church, would you think that Ms. Banegas should go to a, a different portion of the community board with this message, perhaps? Or do you, do you feel like it's appropriate for this committee? Um, I spoke with Ms. Bodegas earlier today. Um, unless she wants to do a full presentation, then she could go to any committee and deliver it because it's for the broader community. Um, but if she'd like to do a full presentation, then it would be appropriate for the Transportation and Public Safety Committee. 
And if the board agenda is really light one month, then it could also be at a full board meeting. Okay. Any other members of the community? I have a, I have a question, Brandon, for Ms. Banegas. Can I ask her? Um, or, or? If, if you can, if, if you can uh, keep it somewhat brief, that would be great. And feel free to go ahead. 10 seconds. Uh, Ms. Banegas, how does one, how does sort of a, a civilian, someone report misconduct? Is there a quick and easy way? Is it the CCRB have an app? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, thank you so much for asking. So there are a couple of ways you can file a complaint. One is you can call 311 and say, hey, I want to file a complaint um, with the CCRB or um, I want to report police misconduct and they'll actually connect you with the agency. You can also call our hotline, which is 1-800-341-CCRB. And I can actually share that information as well. Um, you can come in person to the office. Um, we're located downtown 100 Church Street. And in um, situations where a person isn't able to come in person, um, an investigator may be able to go and meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Next part of the agenda tonight is approval of the minutes from October the 6th. I encourage everybody to read the minutes. They were updated with a lot of additional language in the, uh, and they're available in the Google Drive. Um, with that, with those revisions, does anybody wish to make a motion regarding the minutes? Mr. Harrison, are you moving to approve the, the minutes? I think that- Yes, uh, yes, I'll, sorry, I was I'll muted, take yes. take that as a quick. yes. Do we have a second? Okay, I've Yeah. Okay, any discussion, any other corrections or thoughts that haven't already been uh, emailed to Ms. Thurston? Hearing none, um, if everybody is on video can raise their hand if they're in favor, that would be great. Um, anyone opposed or abstain, if you can so indicate. Approve. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mr. Andrews, who approves. Okay, um, unanimous, or wait, Ms. Cobb, how do you vote on the minutes? Yes. You vote yes on the minutes, okay, great. Yes. So we got unanimous approval on the minutes. At this point, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. That was, that. who, who made the motion to adjourn? Ms. Einhorn. Ms. Einhorn, uh, I think I have a second from Mr. Second. Newmark. Sorry, Mr. Newmark had his hand up. Um, all in favor, if you can raise your hand. Aye. Uh, Anyone opposed or abstain? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice evening. Brandon. Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. Great meeting. Very good. Bye. Yes, that was so impressive, Brandon. I don't know what to do with my life now. Uh, well, I need you, Brandon.